Well, the Wudang Physical Culture Association came about in 1979, and I'd been for a short while teaching just a few private students. And a while before that, I used a friend of mine's apartment that he was hardly there and taught really small classes. So I had a few students as a following. And a couple of the students and my wife at the time started pressing me to start a school. And they said, you know, people like to study with you. If you set a regular schedule, more people will study with you. You know, the students were like, we'll try and bring our friends. So eventually I taught a couple of classes in my apartment and there really wasn't any room there. That was fun. That was a typical Lower East Side apartment, about exactly like half of this place, which I lived in with a wife and two kids and then trying to teach classes there just didn't work too well. Um, so my good friend, the late Jan Stacy, author Jan Stacy, offered us use in his storefront for a little while. And that was the first official home of the Wudan Physical Culture Association. So we taught in Jan's store for a while. Jan's a great guy, Aikidoist, by the way. I met him at the Aikido Dojo on 18th Street the few months that I studied there. Uh, you know, that whole thing, you bow to who's next to you and start training with him. So you talk to them a little bit and discovered we had mutual friends. That's why I met him. He actually wrote a book called, he wrote a lot of books. He wrote an adventure book a month to make a living. And, uh, but one of his last books was Body Smasher, about a professional wrestler who's, that's really his cover as a CIA agent. And the front of the book is dedicated to um, me, our late boxing coach Bulldog Williams and the gang at the Wudong Gym. And Bulldog appears as himself, as the lead character's boxing coach. And a character based on me simply called Tattoo, who has a hidden Chinese dojo in the support abutment to the Brooklyn Bridge <laughs> and who drags the hero, the 265 pound hero out of the East River with all his bones broken and puts him in alignment and cures him by making him stand in universal post for 12 hours straight. <laughs> uh, what had happened was this had become an abandoned building in around 75 or thereabouts. I should remember I was there. I was living next door at the time. And it's very interesting, the building just emptied just like that. Because all but one apartment was filled by this Native American play troupe who uh, <clears throat> came from a reservation in Washington and worked at La Mama Theater for, I don't know, years. And then one day they said, we're sick of New York. And they all got on their school bus and went back to the reservation. <laughs> and the one Spanish guy that lived what would be right under here got busted for manslaughter the same week. The building was empty. And instead of renting it out, HBD actually sent in uniformed workers who broke out good windows and bricked them and tore out plumbing and they declared the building abandoned. And what happened was three years, three, four years later, the people in Seven and Quando at that point had nine to 11. And they knew if they left this building empty between them, it was gonna bring everything down. So they invited some friends of mine um, to come and live here and three quarters of the guys were workmen with tools and they came in and fixed it Acer, up. who was sort of the granddaddy of the whole place, lived next door, helped everybody out including us and he came down and helped us tear down the ceiling which I remember because Acer's not huge, you know, a 5'10ish, 200 guy, but freakishly strong. And in those days, here's how deserted it was down here, although the few people walking up the sidewalk were a little aghast. We had a dumpster in the street. And in those days, the two center windows were bricks and the side windows were open. And I remember Asa throwing pieces of roof and beam out that window over the sidewalk and into the dumpster. <laughs> people walking up there, seeing these huge things flying over there. But them. yeah, the neighborhood's, neighborhood's been wild. I mean, it was legitimately rough. I mean, we, but we had people like Dangerous Doug Westlake, who like used to try and look, so he was 5'10", 175, he could look big or small, depending on what he wanted. And if he saw people trying to mug him, he would look small to draw them in. And when they made their move, he would blow up, but usually there was no action, they would run away, because suddenly it looked like this guy got twice as big. Um, he had some guy follow him into the hallway, downstairs, a little foyer down there one day with a stick in his hand. And Doug turned around and offered to let him hit him once in the head first, and then we'll start. 
Doug was convinced he could never be knocked out, and I think he was right. And he decided that when he was seven and got kicked in the head by a horse that should have killed him, and it didn't even render him unconscious. And uh, I'll get to another story later, which makes me think he's absolutely right. You just cannot knock this guy out for whatever reason. But he's sure enough of that, he, he told this guy he could hit him in the head with this, with this board, basically. And the guy started to get frightened, and he kept trying to talk the guy into it. <laughs> And then finally the guy said something about his friends on the corner, and Doug said something about, well, get your friends, I'll get mine, I've got a gymnasium upstairs, the guys that are just like me. We were not, but anyway, and the guy kind of ran away. But, but Doug was like that. Doug, was, Doug lived in a loft in what became Dumbo. He and John, who I mentioned before, knew each other. Um, in fact, he came in through Jonathan. But in those days, talk about rough, there was a mugging scene going on where young people riding what looked like decent bicycles across a Brooklyn bridge would get smashed in the head with a two by four and then these Spanish kids would steal a bike and whatever they had. And Doug and his wife were riding across the Brooklyn bridge one day and bam, he took a two by four with a nail in it in the chin, knocked him off his bike, ripped a piece of his chin so it was hanging down. <laughs> Doug jumps up and confronts the guys. The guy with the two by four with the nail in it swings it again, buries the nail in Doug's thigh. Doug jumps back and pulls a board out of the guy's hand, reaches down, pulls it out, and laughs at them as he pulls it out. Steps towards them, they run, but one of them grabs his bag as he runs. Doug jumps on his bike, bicycles after the guy, jumps off him and bulldogs him like a rodeo steer, <laughs> and then punches him a couple times and picks him up and holds him over the bridge with the kid screaming, don't kill me, don't kill me. And Doug's standing there to hold his leg bleeding and his chin hanging off. Right? Throws the kid back on the bridge and the kid runs off and Doug's wife takes him to the hospital to get stitched up. There's no, you can't even get away with being that tough anymore. Oh, no. No, the guys, I mean, people down here were just different in those days. It was dangerous. And because it was dangerous, you know, regular people tended to be ready to deal with such things. Well, I started off studying with Jan, the Iron Man Lang, neighborhood internal teacher, who was a uh, first generation Bruce Francis student. And then he turned me on to Irish Jimmy O'Mara, who was my first young style Tai Chi teacher, and also did Qigong with him and a lot of sparring, fighting stuff with both of them. They were neighborhood street fighting legends, the two of them. O'Mara had been a student of William Chen, Jengmen Cheng, Dan An, came from a traditional Irish boxing family. And then Jan took me to meet B.P. Chan. As I said, when I got there, Jimmy was there, but he hadn't mentioned it. <laughs> and we all studied with B.P. Chan. When Bruce came to town in 76, he came to see Jan. Jan kind of gave me to him as a servant. Uh, Bruce is like, Jan helped me with my, set up some classes. Jan's like, well, I'm really busy, but Frank's got some time, he'll help you. <laughs> That's how I studied, started studying with him. Um, in the 80s, in 84, Vern Williams came to town. Vern the Bulldog Williams became our boxing coach, became my overall life mentor, became pretty much my best friend. And uh, around the same time, Dangerous Doug Westlake showed up, and Dangerous Doug's a grappling master. Well, these days, has given it up and instead is dedicating himself. He makes custom handmade stringed instruments. <laughs> Another multifaceted guy. When he was here, he was bouncing, he was doing construction work, and he was a piano tuner who tuned most of the pianos in the Broadway theaters. Wrestled and played piano. Um, and the two of them worked with me in this whole fighting for health system that we have that's our system of internalizing boxing, kickboxing, grappling, self-defense and weapons, although most of the time spent on boxing, to give us more ways to spar with the internal principles. Those are the guys that helped me put it together, kind of consider them the three, ma well, them and myself, the three masters of fighting for health, with myself representing the Chinese arts and Vern boxing and Doug grappling. So they were like major, major influences on the place. Um, plus the cabinet maker that came in and built everything was Doug's brother-in-law and did it with Doug's help. So overall major influences. So in those days we had a regular wrestling program as well as martial arts grappling and Doug was running 
an arm wrestling team, which was kind of weird, but the guys liked it. Um, Doug at that point was the East Coast light heavyweight arm wrestling champion. And his wife was the women's lightweight national champion. She was awesome. They were a wild family, half Jewish, half Japanese, her and her two brothers, all crazy strong. Brothers did martial arts. Sue had a room full of arm wrestling medals, and trophies. And she was so far above everybody else that in the very last match, she was so pregnant with her daughter that she couldn't face the table. She sat sideways. <laughs> and sitting sideways, she had no leverage. She could not bring this girl down. So she decided, well, I'll just hold on and see what happens. And she's kind of seeing what happens. And this other girl, a poor girl, was one of these people that trained their muscles way beyond their bone structure. Most arm breaks in wrestling are the elbow or the wrist from the torquing of the person taking you down. What this girl did was she applied so much muscular force against what turned out to be an immovable object in Sue's arm that there was this loud snap as her own humerus snapped in half from her own torque. And Sue was so pregnant she couldn't even face the table. And felt bad enough she gave the girl a trophy. She had a room full of them anyway. But, uh, so we had an arm wrestling team for a while also in the 80s, which was rather interesting. And then, of course, with the advent of Tina, Tina brought us into traveling to China. And we did a couple of years studying with Zhang Shen Li, who's a good entry for. Westerners to start to study in Beijing. He specializes in foreigners. And then finally, Tina hooked us up with the Grand Master of Chung Style Baguazhang and the Grand Master of Northern Wu Style Taiji Chuan, Liu Jing Ru and Li Bin Sir, respectively. And we've been studying with them every year and actually have become their formal disciples, which is officially kind of a pretty good step up. It means we hold legitimate lineages coming down from martial arts originators. And you yourself have taken disciples in recent years, right? Do you, how long ago was that? You had a, a group of Two people. years ago, I started taking disciples. I was over 60 and a disciple of a grand master myself and had had my own organization for 30 years. And the three things together seemed like it was an acceptable time. Yeah, that and there were some students that wanted to do that. So I explained to them, yes, you do a ceremony and pay some money to accept a lifetime obligation to make sure that my stuff carries on. <laughs> do you think that, um, I've often heard you talk about this, do you think it's still relevant to the label martial arts as internal and external? Yes, absolutely. There's a lot of misunderstanding of simple basics of this stuff in this country, starting with people thinking that soft and internal mean the same thing and hard and external mean the same thing, but actually internal and external and hard and soft are two different aspects of your martial arts. Internal and external are two different ways of power development. Hard and soft are two different ways of dealing with power that is thrust against you. External power development is simple, basic athletic training. Muscular contraction exercises for strength, aerobic exercises for stamina, Repetitive hand-eye coordination drills to develop unconscious reflexive action for speed. Internal power training replaces this with weight momentum, mind intent, a pumping of the body fluids, and occasionally actual energy discharge. You don't want to waste chi, that's life force energy, for strength. Diaphragmatic breathing and relaxation for stamina. Whenever possible, speed is replaced with timing and positioning. What speed there is, is a byproduct of the relaxation. And there is no unconscious reflexive action. Everything is conscious action. And that in turn gives way to the fairly well-known adage from the Taiji classics, to win first you must lose. And I don't know how much moralistic BS I've seen applied to that, like yes, and you're building character. and you're, it's, it's like those guys were dealing with technical things. And that's exactly what it meant, the difference between conscious movement and unconscious reflexive action. When you start doing it, you have to do C, gap, think, gap, do. Whereas the other guy is just doing C, gap, do. He's got a shorter space. He's faster than you are. 
The only way to develop it is to compete. That's one of the reasons push hands was developed. You can compete without getting punched in the face and kicked in the leg. But you know, you can do push hands, you can do sparring, whatever. You compete where the object is you must stay conscious, not you must win or lose. And you lose. But that's not the object. You know, you know you could flip back to your basic athletic training and do better, maybe even win, not the object. You stay aware. As you do that, the gaps between see and think and think and do start to close. When they get close enough, they close to the point where the guy doing the unconscious reflexive action is caught in that action till it's over. Usually that's a fraction of a second, unless he does Kempo. Then it can last a long time with those 86 shot combinations those guys do. But whatever it is, he can't stop it until the unconscious reflexive action is over. If you can change your mind and change your action while he's stuck in his, you have conceptually gone from slower to faster. But the only way to get that is to go through the period of closing the gaps by losing. So that's a, the conscious action thing. And also, I, I have to keep explaining to my guys, conscious action is not playing chess. It does not mean you're planning three or four moves ahead. Fighting is the best be here now meditation because none of the others will remind you so quickly or graphically when you drift off to the past or the future. But fighters have to remember the next technique is a future. The last technique is a past. You don't want to be thinking about them anymore and you want to be thinking about the grocery list of your girlfriend. You want to be in that moment exactly. <coughs> so internal and external power development. And of course something that a lot of Chinese martial arts instructors don't like to get into is that internal power is not some secret of the hidden arts of China. It's simply the most efficient way the body works. And as such some guys just do it naturally. Some people, you look at a lot of super athletes, and once you know the, the st structure of how this stuff works, they're doing it internally. I think Michael Jordan was kind of internal. I think Sugar Ray Robinson was like completely internal. Some guys just do it. And then I was talking about Jimmy O'Mara, my first Yang style teacher. O'Mara used to tell us, you want to see internal power? You find one of those old guys who's over 70 and does an eight hour physical labor job every day that the body won't use, won't just can't keep up with eight hours of muscle work over the age of 70. But through the doing the same work for decades, looking for how to get the most work done and go home the least tired through trial and error, they have internalized their work. That's how they can still do it at that age. And you watch them work and it's totally internal power. Over the years of telling that story, it slowly sunk in too that primarily all these guys work for themselves. Because if you work for somebody else, you only care about the going home less tired. You don't care about the getting the most work done. So you never quite bother with the same <laughs> ideology. So, But you see those guys that work for themselves. They're old. They're still doing it. And it's internal power. It's just the natural way things work. And some people have it naturally. Some people get it through trial and error. Chinese internal martial arts and some of the Qigongs give you a nice systematic way to get it quicker. That's all that is. Now, hard and soft are how you deal with power thrust against you. Hard, my force meets your force head on and overcomes it. Soft, give before force and come back where there is no force against you. Taiji and Aikido are the only two arts that are founded on softness. But they came here decades before any other internal arts. So, henceforth, thinking that they went together all the time. But the art of Xing Yi is internal and completely hard. Xing Yi is my force meets your force head on and crushes you. As my top Xing Yi guy likes to say, if my opponent is the biggest, nastiest, most rabid killer pit bull you ever saw running straight up the street at me, I'm the 18 wheel trailer truck about to run that dog over. That Xing Yi, but it's internally powered. And so Xing Yi's internal hard, Tai Chi is internal soft, Bagua is internal and switches between hard and soft, sometimes in waves, sometimes in milliseconds. But it does hard and soft. And you can mix them anyway, the same way that Xing Yi is internal and hard, it's internal power, but it just meets you and goes right over you. Well, anytime you see one of those tiger claw guys catch the coming punch in a totally external tiger claw grip and rip the punch in the direction it's going. That's force with force. That's external soft.
they're using external power, but they're using a soft ideology of giving before the force, not coming against the force. So you can mix those things up in any manner. So uh, just getting back around to our location, I mean, it looks like to me the East Village is pretty much that you remember that's been, I think, idealized in a lot of people's minds, even though everyone's like, oh yeah, it was scary. People think about the amazing kind of creativity that was coming out of the area. Do you think it's it's gone? Are there other people like yourself who still remember it hanging out around here, or is it has everyone moved on? Well, there's, there's bits and pieces of it. There's bits and pieces of it here and there. I mean, uh, Mikey Feinlein's tattooing lost their place when they tore down his block on Bowery, but they've had a shop on First Avenue, and he's trained his son who runs the shop now. And There are bits and pieces of it here and there. There's still a bookstore on First Avenue that's buying used books. And, you know, who knows how long it will last. Um, cities do this. I and mean, when it's us, I mean, this is horrible, and this is half my life, and I hate losing this place. And on the other hand of it, though, I remember when I moved to New York in 1970, it was supposed to be for a weekend, by the way, and I'm still here, um, <laughs> for real. And uh, everybody was upset about the World Trade Centers. Now that they've been knocked down, I mean, the, the horrible thing of people getting killed aside, which is a whole separate horrible issue, but that aside, the buildings themselves suddenly have some mystique as if they were nice buildings. When I first got here, people were livid over the fact that first off, 12 blocks of downtown were emptied to build a World Trade Center. And all the small businessmen in the city gave them eminent domain payment, take it or leave it, and threw them out. People were really... And then they built what at that point was known as the buck teeth at the end of the island that ruined our Art Deco skyline. Um, but then they displaced poor people to build a Roman Colosseum. Unfortunately, it's my turn. As I've been telling people, you know, Bagua is based on the art of change at its highest, highest levels, besides being just a martial art that continuously moves and continuously circles and coils and twists and changes. At its highest levels, it's an energetic and physical manifestation of the study of the Chinese classic of change, the I Ching. So I've been teaching change for decades, and now here it is, <clears throat> right in my face, and I gotta live it. I'm not happy about it, but it's, it's life. <laughs>